Welcome to the Red Sneaker Podcast, your guide to success in the worlds of writing and publishing. Now, here's your host, best-selling author and founder of the Red Sneaker Writers Center, William Bernhardt. Hello, Red Sneaker Writers. This is episode 16 going out on April 8, 2019. This podcast is for Red Sneaker Writers, people who are serious about having a writing career and looking for practical knowledge to help them do it. My guest for this episode is Danielle Norman, a children's and women's fiction writer who has a unique approach to her work. She dictates her early drafts. But before you dismiss that idea out of hand, let me just tell you that this technique allowed her to go from never having written to multiple book contract with Simon & Schuster in about seven months. Her feeling is that dictating those early drafts allowed her to find her voice, which is what has made her work stand out from the crowd. On this episode, I'm also going to be offering some writing tips pertaining to making your work appeal to the movie and TV community. But first, the news. Lots of news for us to talk about this week. First, let's talk about Barnes & Noble, which has just opened its 10th bookstore of the future. That's what they call it anyway. It's a prototype bookstore. The newest one is in Rochester Hills, Michigan. The idea behind these new stores, 14,000 square feet approximately in size, is that they're about half the size of Barnes & Noble's normal retail stores. They feature a brighter interior, more face-out book displays, lower bookshelves, and a wider range of sidelines, meaning non-book products, toys, games, gifts, that sort of thing. It looks a little different from your typical Barnes & Noble. And, of course, what they're hoping is to give their stores a more energized, contemporary feel, and perhaps also to lower their overhead so that they can survive. I gotta tell you, I haven't been in one, but I've looked at the pictures online and it does not look that different to me. Whether or not this is going to be the innovation that saves the company from what appears to be a steady decline is yet to be seen. But sadly, I have my doubts. In Amazon, there's new news there. I suppose all news is new news by definition, isn't it? But anyway, at Amazon, they're talking about their new updated Kindle, their reading device. They've got one now that, for the first time, has a front light but sells for under $100. Front light meaning that users can adjust the display brightness for various lighting conditions. It comes in a couple colors. It's actually eighty nine ninety nine. It'll be available on April 10, a few days from when this podcast comes out. Why is this significant to Red Sneaker Writers? Well, I got to assume that if Kindles are cheaper, more people are going to read them. More people are going to read on them. It seems like any time I get on an airplane anymore, most of the people there are reading not newspapers, not books, but on their Kindles, if they're reading at all, as opposed to watching some program on their phones, or iPads. Well, if you're a writer, and particularly a self-published writer, and you're using Amazon ads, this becomes pretty significant when you're deciding what kind of ad you're going to choose. The range of things you can do with Amazon ads is already expanding. Good if you like variety. Bad if it's getting too complicated for you to comprehend. A lot of the opportunities that were exclusive to Amazon Advantage are now slowly trickling into Amazon ads where everybody can get them. And one of these opportunities is the ability to put an ad on people's Kindle devices. In other words, they don't have to go to the web page to see your ad and key in the right keywords to see your ad. It shows up on the face of their Kindles. If more people use Kindles, then that way of advertising becomes more desirable. Speaking of Amazon, let's talk a little bit about their so-called most favored nation policy, because I don't think I've discussed that before on the podcast. A few weeks ago, they announced to general acclaim they will no longer require third-party merchants 
that sell products on the Amazon platform in the United States to offer the same or better price at Amazon that they're offering on other websites. As you may know, Amazon required the best price or a matched price, but at any rate, if they found out that there was a better price somewhere else, they would either adjust the price to match or simply refuse to carry your product. Well, some people thought that this was not entirely the way the world ought to be. And in fact, some senatorial types felt that it violated antitrust law because it was anti-competitive behavior. So generally, people were glad when Amazon said they weren't going to do that anymore. But here's the question. Who exactly is a third-party merchant? Because they made it clear that they were only rescinding this requirement for third-party merchants. For the Red Sneaker Writers concern, does this include writers? Does this include authors who own their own work but sell it through Amazon, typically using Kindle Direct Publishing? I mean, we are independent contractors when we do that. We are third-party merchants, aren't we, merchants? Well, according to Amazon, no, we're not. This is completely different, and they do not consider authors publishing on KDP to be third-party merchants. Here's the official explanation. See if you can track this. Quote, KDP authors do not set the author price. We do. This is from an Amazon spokesperson, obviously. What KDP authors do is set the list price for their books and, as is standard in book publishing, we require that they set the list price on Amazon no higher than they do elsewhere. With one exception, we then pay royalties based on the list price, regardless of where we set the customer price, end quote. Well, that's true. Typically, Amazon discounts the book a little bit, but still pay you a percentage, 35 or 70 percent, depending upon what choice you've made, based upon what you said the price ought to be. My question, and here legal training may be getting in my way, but isn't this a difference without a distinction? I mean, sure, that's true. We set the price. They sell it for whatever. They pay us royalties based on the price we chose. But what's that got to do with being a third-party vendor? Aren't we still third-party merchants since we are, in fact, taking things we own and selling them on the Amazon platform? I don't see how that makes any difference. But bottom line here is Amazon is still considering all of us to be not third-party merchants and thus They don't want to see you selling your book or less anywhere else on the web. Speaking of what you can and cannot do with your books, some people have wondered, can you resell an ebook? I mean, clearly you can resell a print book. People do it all the time, right? That's what used bookstores are full of. Or people give them to friends or sell them or give them to good year, a goodwill or sometimes, uh, you know, uh, sell them on eBay. Can you do the same thing with eBooks? Some people thought you could, and the lawsuit that arose concerned a company called ReDigi, R-E-D-I-G-I, which was an online marketplace that allowed people to sell iTunes files, songs primarily, but could conceivably be audiobooks, that they didn't want anymore. Well, that went all the way to the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit that ruled that uh, basically the answer is no. Can you resell ebooks or other digital files? They say no. They say it's unlawful. The Court of Appeals conclusion was based on the idea that the first sale doctrine does not apply in this case. The first sale doctrine basically says that copyright owners, like us authors, have to be paid the first time it's sold but not any time thereafter. Well, the Court of Appeals says that that doesn't apply here because when you sell a digital file, what you're really doing is making a copy of it. And to some extent, that is true. If you take it from your computer to somewhere else, a copy is being made. And thus, they said it was, it's more like if you took your print book and made a, a, a photocopy of every page and gave it to someone rather than selling what you actually own. It's not the same. 
So according to the Second Circuit, you cannot resell your digital files like audiobooks. I wonder if it would be different if there were some kind of technology that made the transfer that destroyed all copies on the first computer while transferring the files to the second computer, the person who's buying it. I wonder if that might make it more acceptable to the courts. At any rate, that's not what happened. And so as of right now, you can't be selling your digital files. And one last item, which is really a follow-up to something I said in the last podcast when I talked about the data indicating that although sales were generally flat with the big five traditional publishers, they were actually making more money. I don't think I clarified the fact that although they are pricing ebooks in order to discourage people from buying them, making them in some cases more expensive than the hardcover in order to push people toward print, that does not in any way mean that the big five are not using Amazon. They are using Amazon. It's everybody's number one market in the book world. They may be selling print through Amazon more than they're selling ebooks, but they're still using Amazon. And that's one key reason they've been able to increase their profits, even though their sales numbers are not particularly going up. It's because Amazon is the most desirable market, not only because they sell more books, but also because they have fewer returns. As you probably know, with traditional bookstores, publishers have to deal with books that are returned at some point for credit, which is a very expensive process. They don't have that at Amazon at all, or to a much less degree. Another key point coming out of this data that I want to make clear that I don't think I emphasized enough last time is that Amazon still, in this day and age, has a big advantage to you as a Red Sneaker writer over legacy publishers or corporate publishers or whatever you want to call them, particularly when you are an unknown or just beginning author who is building a market. Because Amazon has an unmatched ability to market books and authors. They have an unmatched ability to put keyly targeted suggestions in front of people who buy books, you know, people who bought this also liked that. And a lot of that stuff is paid for. But the fact is their algorithms, their keywords, their searches give them primo ability to get your book in front of people who might well buy it. I mean, nothing like that exists anywhere else. That's basically what people are paying for when they shell out for Amazon ads. That can be tricky. You got to work it. You got to be careful about your keywords and don't end up spending more than you actually make. But that's the big advantage. Arguably, traditional or corporate publishing hasn't had a breakout author since 2009 when the digital revolution began. Mind you, there are a lot of big names there. Legacy authors, James Patterson, John Grisham, People like that who broke out before the digital revolution. But since that time, most of the people who are making names for themselves are doing it Amazon, either through Amazon's Amazon's own publishing division, Amazon Publishing, where you'll see thriller writers like Robert Dugoni, who has done very well with their thriller imprint, Thomas and Mercer, or people who are doing it themselves through the KDP route, like Scott Pratt, another thriller author who has done extremely well targeting the people who would be interested in his books. Now, there's more to it than that, but I did feel that I didn't bring that point home very well, so I wanted to get back to it. There are always going to be different advantages and disadvantages, whatever route to publication you choose corporate, independent, hybrid, something in between. But it does appear that if you are a beginning, starting out writer, in particular if you don't grab the brass ring and land the great agent and the great publisher right off the bat, 
your ability to build an audience to target people who might be interested in your books is greater at Amazon than it's going to be anywhere else. 